I think everybody was gripped in a horror yesterday when the news about Mike Lynch and his yacht and all those on board and the situation they were in. I mean, it's it's horrific in itself, and I know Laura's going to talk to us about the weather events that, that may have led to this in a bit. But for him particularly, after the most extraordinary some 10 to 13 years of fighting the case, to find himself celebrating a holiday, holiday and this bad luck landing, Kieran. Yeah, this was his great summer getaway after a you know, really, really tough 10 years, essentially mm. fighting this fraud case in the US, uh, you know, trying to make sure that the case would have been heard in so the UK. So just explain for people who don't know, yeah. he's sort of dubbed the, the British Bill Gates. Yeah, I mean, it's a little... He's a tech billionaire. He's a, he's a tech millionaire, I think. I'm ah. not sure whether he was a billionaire. <laughs> Um, but he, yeah, he, he, yeah, he was. He, he'd made a lot of money. Made a lot yeah. of money in autonomy, and, and he had set up this company called Autonomy, which essentially what the company did was it took huge caches of data and it analysed them very, very quickly. And he did that using probability and, and complicated maths. This was so valuable that it got bought by Hewlett Packard for eleven billion dollars. Huge deal for a UK, uh, you know, started company, mm. tech company. Great success story for the UK tech sector. But almost as soon as Hewlett Packard took that company over for 11 billion, mm -hmm. it then wrote down the value of that acquisition by 8.8 .8 billion. So it said almost all the, of what they'd paid was essentially worthless. Right. Then so said, then the accusation the money? started. Yeah. Exactly. And they then accused very high uh, senior figures at the company, including Mike Lynch, of being implicated in fraud and essentially overinflating the value of the company to be able to sell it off for a high value cash in and go away mm. before anybody realised what was going on. And Kwasi, one of the co-defendants in that case has died recently as well, which yeah, just... Yeah, I mean, that's the just... freakish element of the coincidence, is that both two of the people who were co-defendants, who'd only got off two months ago, then died in separate, completely unrelated, freakish accidents within three or four days of each other. So this so is Stephen, Stephen Chamberlain. That's right. Uh, and Mike Lynch, obviously, on the boat. That's exactly right. And that's mm. why social media is going crazy. And he was running and he was hit by a car. That's right. Oh. So, so, so these two fat fatalities mm. happening within days of each other has meant that social media is going bananas. As, a, as a, some as kind of conspiracy. Or, or something like that. I mean, that. the thing for, for Mike Lynch as well is that he absolutely stood by the idea that he was innocent. Very That's often right. these sort of financial cases get settled out of court in a, in a deal, don't they? But he said, no, it's a huge gamble, roll of the dice. I'm going to stand by my belief and ability to prove I'm innocent, was extradited to the US. That's right to deal with it there, and only in June was cleared of all charges by a jury. He was cleared of all criminal charges. There was a separate civil case uh, for around $4 billion uh, where he was sued by the successor company that did eventually take over, mm. and largely he lost that case. Now, of course, the civil case has a different burden of proof. You can say 50-50, you know, if it's more than 50% likely mm. that he knew about what had gone on at the company, then uh, he could be found guilty on that. But a criminal case is that much harder to prove. But it was pretty extraordinary. I mean, mm. let's face it. I mean, because generally, if the US government is coming, the federal government is coming after you, yeah. your chances of actually defending yourself mm. are pretty slim. And I remember when we were in government, the issue of his extradition was, was almost a political football because I think Priti Patel was Home Secretary at the time. Yeah. And they put a huge amount of pressure on us, on her and others to extradite him. And I think the assumption was that he was probably going to go down um, because the, the, the US system, the federal system, the justice system... Yeah, I think there's less so than, like, 3% this. of those that stand up That's in that right. situation mm. are found to be not guilty. Yes, the it was an extraordinary acquittal yeah. and, and a real testament to the fact that he was had the courage Mm. Uh, of his conviction mm. to, fight, you want, to fight the case. And you wonder whether that's expensive lawyers, obviously a man with a lot of money. True. Um, yes, yeah, so the US federal about... government has even more money. They've got more money yeah. than well, any lawyer. Talks about it and, um, <laughs> yeah, and a lot of very rich people have gone down. I mean, you know, you look at the, the part, you know, this um, cryptocurrency guy, Sam, Sam bankman fried other people who had lots of resources, they, they do go down. So that's the background to this. But the, the tragedy that's unfolding before our eyes is that he is there on holiday with his wife, his 18-year-old daughter, and a number of friends on this yacht, which I think it's widely believed amongst his friends was a sort of... He talked, hadn't he, about he's been given a second lease of life. That's he exactly wasn't right. sure what to do with it, but after some decade or more of fighting this awful thing hanging over himself, he was going on a holiday 
to relax and think about the future when tragedy struck. Now, Laura is here to explain what was going on in the Med at that time, Laura. It was a particular set of weather circumstances, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. So people are talking about a water spout. And a water spout is essentially a tornado that happens over the water. So a violently rotating column of air that goes from the cloud to the water full of air and water. It hasn't been confirmed that this water spout was responsible from authorities yet, but looking at the weather charts, a weather front moves through, it was very, very stormy, and it's on the back edge of weather fronts you are most likely to see water spouts developing. And, of course, these can cause winds of up to 100 miles an hour. These normally happen through more places like the Caribbean, really tropical areas, but the seas at the moment through the Mediterranean are much higher than they would normally be. It's worth pointing out there's this thing called knockdown. So it's actually really difficult to cause a super yacht to sink. Some said something smaller like a dinghy. But because the mast is so high, with these really strong winds, or really big waves, you can actually cause the vertical mast to go horizontal or snap off completely. So people did observe a water spout around about the time that we saw the capsizing of the yacht, and that is what a water spout looks like. So this big rotating column of air, like I said, with winds of up to 100 miles an hour, and it's likely that a tornadic water spout was in the area around the time of the yacht capsizing. Is, is this anything to do, because I've never heard of this sort of thing, is this something to do with climate change? Is this a new phenomenon that we're going to be seeing a lot more of? So. There's definitely a link between seeing more ferocious storms, more tornadic activity, because a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. For every one degree we see the atmosphere warming, it holds 7% more moisture. And the sea temperatures at the moment are way above where they should be through the Mediterranean, so extra heat is more energy. More energy means bigger storms, and bigger storms means more likely to see more tornadoes and water spouts. So, Laura, just for those to, to be absolutely clear then, a water spout is essentially like we see, we think of with a tornado, mm -hmm. where it whips up land, dirt, animals sometimes, trees. What it's doing in this incident, in, in situation, is it's whipping up water and turning yes. it to a swirling mist. Exactly. Is that right? Exactly. So a tornado happens over land and picks up debris. A water spout is exactly the same phenomena, but it happens over the sea. It's where it touches from cloud to the sea, but it's full of air and water, but it can cause winds of up to 100 miles an hour. Yeah, terrifying. And, of course, we've spoken about Mike Lynch. His 80-year-old daughter, Hannah, is also missing. Thankfully... Some 15 people on board have been rescued and some of their stories are really sure. disturbing. I know you want yeah. to talk about Charlotte, don't you? I mean, mum, Charlotte Galunsky. The, the front page of the Mirror and the Sun. Um, Hero mum saves baby in sea health. So this is Charlotte uh, Galinsky. Uh, she uh, happened to be on board. So this is 4am in the morning, so it's probably dark. Uh, she's on board, on, on deck, actually, with her baby, her one-year-old baby. And, I mean, presumably, maybe she's feeding the baby. And that just happened to mean that she was on the deck, which may have been the thing that saved her life, sure. because she was thrown into the water. And she talks about how she lost her baby. I mean, you can imagine anyone who's had a one-year-old baby. I mean, they don't do a lot of that age. They definitely can't swim. And you just want to hold on to them, but you're right. falling into the water. She lost the baby for a period of time, and then got, period, and then got a bat. And she's, I mean, this account of how she survived and how she saved a baby. It's devastating. Uh, you, I you, mean, you she was it... screaming for help, but couldn't be her because there were so many other screaming around her. And had to, I mean, it's heroic kind of uh, maternal energy, isn't it? She found sure. somewhere to keep treading water and hold her little baby above her head until sort of somewhat miraculously it must have felt to her an inflatable life raft appeared alongside. But there are six people still missing. And as the hours go on, one has to fear for their safety. That's right. I mean, we saw this uh, similar uh, incident, a disaster um, with the uh, submersible last year, the Titan. And the reason I bring that up is that as each day passes, uh, it, it becomes less hopeful. I mean, the outlook mm. becomes... Uh, more, more, more disconcerting. So, fingers crossed, we don't know what's happened. Uh, but as you say, as you he we hear less about the people, we don't hear, the longer the period goes, um, the, the, the more difficult, I think, that the outcome will be. Shall we move on to... Well, I was just yeah. going to say, Richard Gaysford is there and he's going to, he's going to give, um, keep us posted on mm -hmm. that report. He landed in the middle of the night himself. Uh, to keep an eye on that that rescue effort. But, yes, you're right, also, while everybody else was sleeping, yeah, the, there was a lot going on yeah, in the US, The Democratic there? National Convention. So Joe Biden, they talk about him 
uh, having on days and off days. And we've all seen all the all the stuff on the internet about when he has an off day. Um, you see him stumbling. You see mm. him stumbling over words, mixing up names. But he he was having an on day at the uh, this uh, the Democratic National Convention. I, I got into. Got in this morning, I watched a bit of it, and he was he had fire in the belly, mm. and he was singing the praises of Kamala Harris, which of course you would do, but in a in a way that you expected him to do what you saw he was doing four or five years ago. Uh, it's it's extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. What's extraordinary to me is watching that. You think if this had happened during that mm. debate, that fateful debate against Donald Trump, mm. he might still be the candidate. Quite. And I think partly partly what that tells us is. There was a real responsibility, both from Biden himself, but also the people around us, to tell us this was happening earlier. Because you can cover it up when someone has on days and off days like that. Mm. I think that actually the Democrats have dropped the ball here. And to allow him to continue as the candidate, where clearly, you know, he was having these days where he wasn't able to focus and wasn't able to concentrate, you know, whatever, maybe so... having memory lapses, they should have spoken up earlier because, you know, if he can perform like that, he can continue for quite yeah, a while a without people realising. You know, as a polit political figure, he, he will appreciate there are very different contexts, you know. So he probably he might have had a teleprompter, mm. he'd have been mm. more tightly scripted. The whole it point was about his a debate. farewell speech. <laughs> That's right. That gives you a certain energy, exactly. doesn't it? Yeah. But, exactly. But he's had teleprompters before and, and looked No, but the really debate, bothering. he didn't. That was the issue. The debate yeah. was so shocking, mm -hmm. yeah. was that it was an hour and a half and uh, he, 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 he flubbed the debate, as the Americans uh, put it. He, he, he didn't perform well at all. Um, and that was the reason why, I'm afraid, uh, for him, the, the, the establishment, uh, the Democratic establishment, people like Nancy Pelosi, the former Speaker of the House, uh, got behind uh, a bid to remove him. And the deal was always, when Nancy Pelosi and others were organising to try and get him off the ticket, the deal was, look, if you go quietly, we'll give you the most fantastic send-off. Exactly Which right. it was. I mean, That's it exactly was an absolute... Right. And, and justifiably, That's I exactly mean, the man right. has, has devoted and his also, life to serve. And also, they felt a bit guilty. I mean, there was a yeah. sense in which they praised him and they, you know, they feel a bit guilty that they got rid of him. Mm. Hillary Clinton got an absolute rousing uh, welcome as well, didn't she? Yes. And how do you feel that Kamala Harris is going down? Well, so far, I mean, she's uh, doing incredibly well. She's essentially made up all the ground that Biden had lost to Trump. The polls are now suggesting it is 50-50, and there are some polls suggesting she's pulled ahead in key swing states, uh, places like Michigan, Pennsylvania, those Rust Belt states that Trump won back in 2016. But it is very, very narrow. She does have a lead, and, and Trump has a lead in other swing states. I think, I think I, yeah, I think you're right. I think if you look at the, the polling four years ago, Biden was up about eight points. Even in 2016, at this stage, Hillary Clinton was up about six points. Mm. Kamala Harris is now up, I think, one or two. So, I th you know, even though it's 50-50, I wouldn't be surprised if Trump still, still wins. Isn't it about momentum, though? She yeah, she's definitely got momentum. She's yeah, she's definitely got momentum. And it's clearly the case that, as Kieran said, uh, she's doing a lot better than Biden was doing. Yeah. I mean, oh. is, it, is it worrying that Hillary Clinton actually had a real, you know, she had... People were applauding her for a very long time. And, you know, when you start a speech and they keep applauding and you can't quite start the speech, it was, it was like that. Is that worrying that Hillary Clinton is the person that they were... No, so I think Kamala say? Harris, in her own right, is uh, getting a lot of momentum. The issue is that, you know, if her, when her policies get scrutinised, um, she, and she is quite far left uh, by American standards, um, th then... Trump, I, I think the Republicans think Trump will win. Well, I, talking I, of Trump, you said he's got, he got she's got the matter. Donald Trump thinks uh, he's got Taylor Swift <laughs> supporting him. Um, Quite the he, endorsement. Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't Taylor Swift, it was AI. <clears throat> but it, it appears as though Donald Trump didn't realise it. So this was the uh, posting on X, I believe, which... He <laughs> reposted. Taylor wants I mean, you to vote for Donald Trump. So this is the first time I'm seeing this, and when we were talking about this in the meeting, I thought it was a genuine picture of Taylor Swift, right. and he just made a mistake the, to repost right. it. But that's clearly been AI generated, and you can't that's do really that, good. can you? Well, maybe he's, she... he's. I mean, he just said I accept, uh, and reposted it. Now, does I mean... this make him look foolish? Because that's the interesting thing, isn't it, about where we are now? That you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, Donald Trump was making use of the fact that Joe Biden seemed um, unsure of himself. There were questions about his age. Suddenly, Kamala Harris is here. That's right. And Donald Trump seems to be, you know, making speeches which people are suggest aren't that coherent. Well, he never really was no. uh, that coherent no. in the first place. But you're quite right. I mean, Biden was 81. Mm. 
Mm. Trump is 78 and Kamala Harris is 59. So they've, they've completely flipped it so that Trump is now the oldest person who's ever run for the presidency mm. uh, because Biden's not running anymore. And now, you know, the age, the focus on Trump's age will be much more acute. That's, that's what the Democrats are hoping. And, of course, he, he's not scoring so highly with young people, Kamala Harris says, Kieran, I mean, getting Taylor Swift on board is a way of getting young voters, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Even if, if it is the real Taylor, Taylor Swift, Swift. Sorry, yeah. we just need to confirm no, that. No, no, exactly. <laughs> Let me give you a prediction. Taylor Swift will not endorse Donald Trump. <laughs> she is not a Republican. She's no. certainly not a Donald Trump fan. But I think what this really shows us is what Kamala Harris has managed to do over the last few weeks has put Donald Trump on the back foot. And there is some extraordinary reporting coming out of the US at the moment about just quite how much turmoil, turmoil his campaign is in. They don't know how to attack Kamala Harris. And usually that's Donald Trump's strength. He knows exactly... He can do the nicknames. He can do, he yeah, he's yeah. very good at that. And he's, he's had about three different nicknames for Kamala Harris. He's mm. trying crazy Kamala at the moment. It just changes all the time. He doesn't quite know which attack line to go that's with. Right. Is there a danger he comes across like a bully? Yes. Because she's a younger woman. I think so. Him, the fact that she's a like... woman of colour, the fact that she's younger, makes it more difficult mm. for him. But at the same time, it's still a very close race. And I think mm. a lot of the US media, and some of the media here, have really got behind uh, Kamala. I mean, she's a, transition, a transformational candidate. She's a, a woman, the first female VP and, and, and all of that. But I think it's still a very close race. And I think Trump uh, has, a, has a, a good chance of winning. I mean, I think you're talking about she's, she's quite left for America, but why isn't he attacking on policy? Because that would play to his voters. So he is essentially an entertainer. So when he's in those rallies, he's not going to be talking about tax policy. He's, it's, it's, but that he's would be the himself. obvious thing I think, to I do, think you're I mean... right. But, but I also think that, you know, he feels that, well, I've won before on this. So, so why should I change now? Also, you forget his economic policies are actually relatively left-wing, a lot of them. Mm. Well, what we bits think and pieces. I mean, he's a tax cutter, but he does do protection. But he does, yeah, he's very yeah, protectionist. So I think he feels that he can't quite go for her on things like, you know... When what she, about the, migra the migrants? I mean, she... Yeah, 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 I'm sure he will do that. That's an obvious... He, I, I think, I think the, there's always a thing in, in these elections, you know, there's a September-October surprise. We're in the middle of August. Let's see what happens. I think mm. they'll go very, very hard on her record. And they'll go very hard on the on the migration, the immigration issue. And she hasn't always run great campaigns in the past either. So oh. yeah. So uh, you say that Donald Trump is essentially an entertainer. He didn't uh, doesn't appear to have entertained the Queen no. very much. Uh, certainly, if Craig Brown's new book is to be believed, apparently, uh, in his book, he says the Queen found Donald Trump very rude when he was entertaining uh, him and Melania at various the state occasions on his visit. Didn't like the fact he was sort of looking over her shoulder to see if there was somebody more interesting around. Um, and he even uh, speculated that maybe Donald Trump and Melania had some sort of arrangement with their marriage. I know. Um, I don't, we, we're not what, what, what quite sure what that is, because we haven't got the actual sure. book. But apparently it seems that he was suggesting that the implication is that somehow maybe she was there not just out of pure love for Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> the first Donald I've heard Trump. of that. I mean, like, nobody said that. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody has ever suggested no. that she's with him what was for it? any other reason than pure love. Other than pure love devotion. and respect. Absolutely. What, what was it about the billions of pounds <laughs> yeah. that, that, that Absolutely. she fell in love with? The question when I was in Washington was always, was she living at the White House? We, we, oh. we never knew whether she was living at the White House or not. The suspicion was she, was, she stayed in New York. And I so think you, if you, yeah. And you were at the White House when Donald Trump and Melania were there, weren't you? Yeah, I was, in, I was in Washington covering, yeah, the last two years of Donald Trump's presence. Was it fascinating to cover? Yeah, it was, but it was also very difficult to cover as a reporter mm. because what would happen is you'd have your list of stories that you're chasing and Donald Trump would completely upend that list because he'd watch Fo Fox News in the morning mm. and tweet about whatever he watched and suddenly you think, oh, the president's thinking about something completely different today. <laughs> <laughs> so because he was very disorganised in his thinking, it was very difficult for reporters to kind of follow what he was likely to do on, on any given day. But I was there on January the 6th and that was the most extraordinary thing that I've was watched. It? happen mm. live, yeah. And I was there for all the committee hearings afterwards. And, you know, the footage from inside the building, trying to get Mike Pence out of the way of this mob as it came up the stairs was really, really shocking to watch. Mm. And devastating, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, look, yesterday we were talking about prisons, weren't we? Yes. The huge um, challenge that's been perhaps brought to the front of everybody's attention, although I'm sure many that were involved in it were talking about it long before because of the riots for a couple of weeks ago, that they are overcrowded, there are not enough places, and now police cells are having to be used. Well, on the front page of the Eye, 
They're saying that it's worse than that. It looks like that what those that are arrested or remanded will actually have to stay on the streets. This is what solicitors are warning after more than 100 prisoners who should have been in court are staying in police cells. And we were discussing this yesterday, weren't we? We yeah, were saying right. that if the prisons are full and people in police cells, what does that mean when new arrests have to that's be right. made? Well, that's the thing. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's going to be a backlog. If you don't have the capacity and you don't have prison places, obviously, the more people you put into the system, the more the, mm. the, the, you know, the, 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 the whole pipeline will be clogged up. And so that means... Uh, that people won't, uh, mm. convicted felons won't be in, in, in the prison system. They'll, some of them will have to be, as you say, on the streets. I mean, uh, the uh, ones who are waiting for their convictions, not, I, not the... I mean, one thing that isn't in this debate, and I know it's more of a long-term view, but is re-offending rates. Lots of That's prisoners right. have been in before, and I, I can't think what the figures are, but it's, it's shockingly right. high. I mean, is it about 50%? I'm, I'm, but this is, goes it's, to the it's heart a of... It's a ridiculously high amount. But this is what we were talking about, in a way, yesterday, because clearly, I think, with the public, there is a demand for people to be locked up and, and serve, you know, stiff mm. sentences. Uh, but at the same time, if all you're doing in prison is learning how to commit more crimes, mm. um, one wonders how effective prison uh, and prison sentences actually are. But I, I that hear that. goes to I the hear, centre of the debate. I hear that all the time, and that seems like such a logical thing to say, and yet it never happens, Kieran, because the public don't want it. It's yeah. almost like sort of this... You know, we're from medieval times and we want to burn people on the no, stake and things like that. It, it, forgive me. I mean, I think surely the public, yeah. it doesn't work. No, because if... the scary thing, you know, what you have to do in a, in, a, in a penal system is keep dangerous people off the streets. Yeah. But, so if, but if, if, if dangerous people are getting very short sentences, um, they get put back onto the streets and can commit more crimes. That does happen. Yeah. Now, I think you've got a point about what actually happens in prison. So the, the issue is to reform the prisons and to improve them so that they don't simply just produce more uh, criminals when they, when they leave. But I think the public is quite right to say, uh, to think that, uh, you know, we want these people off our streets. But also, how many of those in prison are non-violent offenders? You well, know, that, women is, not... is a big thing. Yeah. Lots of women go to prison for very small things, small crimes, mm -hmm. and then they end up coming out being sort of criminalised in many ways. And actually, do they really need to be in prison? Yeah, that, I think... I mean, that's a, a fair, massive thing. That's a fair, fair point. And, and you know, we'll, we'll see it again, because Labour are, I think, next month going to roll out this scheme for early release of offenders after 40% of their tariffs mm. if they're, you know, non-serious offenders, mm. as a way to free up prison places. Mm. The moment that one of those goes on to commit a crime or that'll a serious be big, crime... That'll be big, and that, that, yeah. Yeah, the whole thing will get reversed. Mm. Uh, well, look, I want to talk about bins. We know whenever <laughs> we talk about bins uh, here on Good Morning Britain, then uh, it, it turns out everybody gets very cross. And uh, the, the Times newspaper are reporting that in places like Merthyr Tidville, the Cotswolds, uh, amongst others, some councils are making households sort their rubbish into as many as ten bins. Yeah. So ten That's different recycling and then on crazy. top of that. Now, we know Rishi Sunak said he wanted to end yes. the, uh, the, the seven, seven bins. bins. That's right. Yeah, That's the right. seven That's bin right. problem. Yeah. But That's for right. those people, that is a lot of heavy lifting. No, it's crazy. Isn't it? And it's inefficient all that as well. I mean, how can you have ten bins in your house? Yeah. I mean, uh, you've got to have a, a very big uh, sort of capacity to have ten different bins and to know exactly what to put in. And for a lot of people, that's the pavement that um, they're having to put it. So it becomes very messy, doesn't it? Why isn't it standard, Kieran, to just have the same thing across the UK? Well, I mean, obviously, bin collections are up to local councils, so mm. local councils will, will get to decide those. I, I personally don't mind sorting my waste into lots of different. What, ten bins. different bins? I, I wouldn't mind. Ten. If I'm it made, with Kieran, if yeah. it made it more likely that those things were going to get recycled, because a big problem is at the moment you dump everything into one big recycling thing. You have got no idea where it goes. Does it go to a sorting? You do facility? have a Does slight it... lack of faith, don't you? Yeah. I mean, you do but hit yeah. ten yeah. different bins. I mean, yeah. I can't even think of what the ten I mean, categories are. Well, I yeah, can so tell, tell you. So you would be a Rosie. Let me get my list out. Too early in the morning for that. And so this is. I I was with you to start with, but when I looked at the list, and I know I know it is a huge list, 10 things. I think actually I counted 11. Green bags, small electrics, uh, textiles, uh, tin. I mean, there are loads of them. But the small, small electrics, le I yeah. thought that's a good idea. Yeah. Means, yeah. Actually, when you have something that's broken, you can't take it to a charity yeah. shop, they won't take it. I end up putting things in, in landfill, and that just yeah. feels so wrong. Do you know what I think it is, actually, is instead of using 10 bins all the time, it's saving you trips to the tip. 
Yeah, so, that's right. Know, so when, when you go, go to the, the tip, tip, you have, have to put it have, in. But I think that's fair enough. Yeah. I think yeah. if you go, yeah, I think if you drive down to the tip and you've so got. So this a is big, just saving you a trip to the um, tip. You see? What? So you're going to have ten you're in, every you're in every house. You're not going to throw away in every you know, small electricals that often. Every no, exactly. I want to know what you think of home of this. Are you with <laughs> Quasi that it's ridiculous, or does it seem quite reasonable, like Kieran? I'm go. I'm going to want to just warn everybody. We're going to talk spiders now. If you're terrified of spiders, please look away. And these spiders, I think, would scare most people because conservation groups are saying that giant spiders the size of rats in some cases <laughs> they're called the fen raft spider they're not venomous they don't bite and they're not venomous but they're now breeding in the uk that is enormous that's size something for my really? celebrity look i mean <laughs> given the, the, the scale of the problems we face i think these spiders are not really top of the agenda you're not scared of spiders I'm not so scared are you, of, I, I hate snakes if it was ah. snakes I'd probably freak worried. out, but, but spiders... Yeah, so what do you think, Karen? I'm sorry, you've just told people that, you know, if they're terrified of spiders, then you've got these huge spiders yeah. <laughs> I know. behind you. Well, that's <laughs> why we wore them, Karen. That's why the duty of death. I think they're pretty harmless. I, Actually, I don't even sure. like looking at that behind me. That's no, no. so creepy. Yeah, yeah, they're creepy crawlies and they're not very nice. They're also but not these, that But these ones, nice. they're, not, they're not that dangerous. So I woke, up, I woke up this morning right. and I was told, oh, you're going to be the main presenter of Good Morning Britain. And I got in the shower and there, there's a massive spider, one of these what? huge spiders. What did you do? And it's actually really... No, I mean, no, I didn't. I'm not totally scared of them, but it was so big. And you get a bit of paper. I just and the problem is, you and you're panicking. trying to get it out of the window, but once it's on the end, it runs up very quickly. No. So it's actually, it's terrifying. You're I'm naked scared. in the shower yeah, with, with, a, a with a spider running up your it's arm. Bit, well, it didn't quite get to my arm, but... I, I got it out the window in it's the It's not end. a pleasant experience, it's not, but it's not it's, like... You're not, your life isn't in danger. It's not going to harm you. No. Even if it runs Ooh, up your arm. Oh, okay. well, OK. <laughs> and they're apparently very good for the environment. They keep bugs down. They do lots of good things. So we mustn't be mean about spiders. But I think I'd be quite daunted to wake up to one. It's if it ran across your pillow or something.